like the woman at the well I was seeking for things that could not satisfy and this to that fountain. <laughs> I'm glad I ate the bread from his oven. He gave me something to satisfy the depth of my soul. <laughs> I gotta say when I was 13 years old, you, you subtract 13 from 82 and you can tell how many years I've been saved. And I want to tell you it's better this morning than it was the day I got saved. It just keeps getting better and better and better. Praise the Lord. Well, it's such a blessing to have Brother Dean McNeese and his family with us today. I appreciate Brother Dean. We were talking earlier. Uh, I, I, I remember I remember when he came, uh, moved from Florida back up here and, and went into evangelism. And that's been a long time ago. We were talking, I came here in 1984. He was 15 years old then. 
Now, he's got gray hair in his beard. That's the reason I don't wear a beard, because mine would be snow white if I had one. But I, but I thank the Lord for Brother Dean his faithfulness. His dad was one of the dearest friends I've ever had, one of the finest, because he preached here for us a number of times. And and uh, I appreciate the McNeese family. Uh, Dean's brothers are, are preachers, and uh, uh, what a blessing. And Mom's such a sweet lady. I don't know how in the world she's endured that all the years, but uh, uh, got to be something real in her life. But I want you to pray for the, the man of God this morning as he comes and opens a word. You listen with your heart this morning and don't have any preconceived ideas about what you ought to do and what you ought not do. You just let the Lord speak to your heart. And if you, you'll do that this morning, you'll leave here a lot better off than you were when you came in. Preacher, thank you for being here. Thank you, Preacher. God bless you. Everybody that loves the Lord, say amen. amen. Hadn't the Lord been good to us? Yes. Grateful grateful. Well, I didn't need any tissues till she got to singing. <laughs> now I got a double barrel. <laughs> Fill my cup, Lord. Isn't that what we need? I gave up on keeping up with Hanky's Brother Pinion and just decided to only go to churches where they have tissue boxes everywhere. <laughs> it's worked out very well. I'm trying to work out my ink pen situation now. But uh, Amen. We've been praying uh, for Sister Pinion, and I'm glad to see her this morning. And uh, been praying for the pastor's family. What a blessing. Y'all forgive my uh, little bit of scruff. I want to be like Brother Hall, and I've just started. <laughs> Two out of the three offering takers had a little goatee, so I was feeling better about it. Uh, uh, this is pure laziness. I'm tired of trying to scrape around my whole face. That's what's going on. <laughs> but y'all have got me in the scruffy stage, so please forgive me. And, uh, of course, when mine gets grown out, it's still scruffy. But it's an honor to be in this pulpit, and I thank God for it. Uh, appreciate Brother Pinion uh, being the man of God that he's been all these years. Uh, have a lot of memories with them and a lot of them around the Tri-State Fellowship. But Jennifer and I live down at Wood Station with a Ringgold address, but we're closer to four other towns than we are Ringgold. <laughs> and when, since when did they move Ringgold all the way into Fort Oglethorpe? That's weird, isn't it? Every... But when we had Preston, now my boy is uh, off preaching in Kentucky today. He's 20. And uh, he's going into his senior year of Bible college over at Crown. And I told him only pay attention to about half of it. But uh, uh, when Preston was born, Jennifer and I went many years, didn't think we was going to have kids. And uh, when Preston was born, we was over here at the hospital in Fort O. And uh, I think we was in there four straight days. And it felt like a month. And when I got out, we stopped at Walmart before we went home, and I run into Brother Pinion. <laughs> and I held him up for about an hour. I would not let him go. <laughs> I hadn't seen outside civilization. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's so hard on us men to have babies. It's a very hard thing. <laughs> you women just don't know. <laughs> and the little couple is going to have twins. I asked her a while ago, did you swallow a bowling ball? She said, two of them. Amen. But you women have no idea how hard it is for us. <laughs> but I remember that running to Brother Pinion, and I kept him there for an hour. And he was patient and kind. Helped me come out of the baby world back into the real world. He transitioned me right there in Walmart. Amen. Brother Pinion, and it was a blessing. The friendship that he had with Brother Herschel Hicks was a real special blessing. And uh, the stories they have of Sister Hicks rolling the windows down in Pigeon Fords and singing Rocky Top <laughs> to everyone that was in earshot. Oh, it's a blessing. Thank God for Christian friends. 
And Brother Roger had been a blessing, Miss Christa, many years. And the Hall family are special to us. Uh, the year 2000, I started the Preacher Boy Camp Meetings in this part of the world. And Bill, me and Bill got close. And uh, Daniel, and I forget the other boy's name. Yeah, we had some great meetings together. And they said, Bill's going up to New York to pastor. So let's pray for him in this foreign missions campaign. <laughs> I may take him on for support. <laughs> going up there, all the foreigners. Yeah. I appreciate this church being kind to my dad. Mom and dad love to come here. Uh, they so much like, they so much similarities and things they had in common with brother and sister Pinion. They loved coming here. They loved the pure music. They loved the realness. Uh, we buried my dad last September, and this was one of his favorite places to come, and we're thankful for that. There's nothing like church, you know it. I need more than three of you to agree with that. You're going to make me say, there's nothing like church, is there? Praise the Lord for it's the family of God and it's the bride of Christ. It's, it's the Lord's design and we're fixing to enter into a thousand years of millennial reign on this earth. I don't ever hear anybody talking about that but it's a reality. Yeah, we're fixing to be in glorified bodies for 1,000 years ruling and reigning on earth. Now if you've been a carnal Christian a selfish Christian, a disobedient believer. I'm, I know you have eternal security, but I don't know what that thousand years is going to look like for you. Not good. I, I don't know. We don't have enough details. He said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That was judgment seat of Christ, Corinthians 3. And he said, uh, some are saved so as by fire. I don't know what that thousand years. A reward for some and regret for other. Thousand years after the second coming of Christ and then the eternal hereafter. But I'm looking forward to it myself. I've not been perfect. I've not been the best I could be and I'm trying to be the best I could be for the Lord. But I have endeavored to be obedient and to be faithful. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to that thousand year reign. I'm not worried about China. I'm not worried about Russia. I'm not worried about the election. I'm a little worried about Hillary. She's always there. <laughs> That's something to be a little worried about. But he's coming back. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 1. We put a little birdie in your ear. That wasn't the way that was, goes, is it? But anyway, you know what I meant. Put a little bug in your ear to remember when you see a flyer on, on the computer or get one in the mail. We have started our camp meeting ministry back up. We had the red field for 12 years. And then Brother Dietz, Went on to heaven. Of course, Danny had went on to heaven. And all the men left me, so I left. <laughs> there wasn't no men left. And I, no, COVID came and shut down all of our meetings. And uh, it's been five years since we'd had a camp meeting. We've started our camp meeting ministry back up February, the end of February, We'll have our camp meeting. It'll be our second one. And the end of July, we just had it last weekend. So mark it on your calendars in the back of your mind. And we've been at the Rome Baptist Temple where Brother Goolsby was the good pastor. And now uh, my sister is there and her brother Chris Hanks, the new pastor, my brother-in-law, and the Lord's just arranged it. We're having the meeting there. And God really blessed this first year. February's the camp meeting. And July's the youth meeting. 
The Lord really helped us. Well, thank you for letting me visit for a moment. Revelation chapter 1. And I got friends here today, and I got another family coming tonight. I think I have earned two chili dogs. <laughs> I don't know if that's the rules, but that's my new rules on it. And then if my wife will look the other direction with my diabetes, I'm going to taste that homemade ice cream. So I need somebody to distract her. I'm just going to taste it. I'm not going to eat much, Brother Roger. I'm not. Maybe two bites. Revelation chapter 1. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for Calvary. And what you gave us there, when you gave your son, Lord, thank you for Pentecost and what you gave us there when you gave us your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the day you saved us and everything you gave us there. Now, Lord, help me in a, for a little while to break the bread of life and you're the only one that can make it warm and fresh. Breathe on us. Lord, exhort this church family today. God, challenge some and console others. Lord, and strengthen all of us. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all the Lord's people said. I'm going to give you one piece of scripture. In the hours that we live... I'm glad that we got some anchors in these last days. Amen. I'm going to say something, see if you'll agree with me. Paul said in the last days, perilous times shall come. Yes. Yes. And we are there. Yes. Perilous times. I'm not going to establish that because I could go on until, I could go on until Thanksgiving sitting here talking about world conditions and church conditions. Do y'all agree with me on that? I could go on and on and on and never exhaust that, that subject. But I've got good news for you. We're on the winning side. Look in the book of Jude. Mm. And again... I'll be careful. There's two hours of preaching right here. Y'all prayed for Brother Buster, our good friend, Brother Kenzie. You prayed for his evangelism this morning, but you didn't pray for mine. So I may go two hours. <laughs> You'll pray next time. But look in Jude, and I got to be careful because there's so much here. Talking about world conditions and church conditions right before the second coming. Underline Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Then back up to Jude. It was J. Vernon McGee, one of them good Presbyterian preachers. J. Vernon McGee. Uh, we don't agree with the Calvinism, but we agreed when they preached Christ. J. Vernon McGee said the book of Jude is a snapshot. He said a Kodak snapshot, but none of them, nobody under 40 would know what that is. A screenshot. How about that, Sister Chris? I don't even know if that's right. But he said it's a little picture of world conditions and church conditions right before Jesus comes back. In Jude, he said in verse 3 at the end of it, you'll have to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. What about that? We don't even have folk that believe the Bible anymore in our generation. And in verse 4, certain men crept in unawares, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Y'all do understand the entire contemporary movement is to take the grace of God and turn it into lasciviousness. Yeah. 
so that Americans will enjoy church. They need it more like a movie theater than they do the house of God because it's lasciviousness that they're after. Then in verse 6, he mentions the angels which kept not their first estate. Y'all understand there's more demonic and evil spirit activity right now probably than ever has been. Verse 7, he mentions Sodom and Gomorrah, fornication and strange flesh. Verse 8, Brother Pinion, we have, and I'm speaking carefully right here, these filthy dreamers. That's the zombies walking around. That's everyone that's strung out on drugs of some sort or another. These dreamers, filthy dreamers, and they're in a they're in an alternate state of mind. That's all of your dope addicts in this hour. And I'll mention a couple of things, a little sensitive topic, but you be very careful. How many of our Vietnam vets came back and they gave them them powerful pain pills and they can't get off of them? And I know that's a sensitive issue, but you be careful. You don't get addicted to pain pills. And then what they call nerve pills. I'm sorry, I have to be honest about this. They're going to stick drugs in every child and every youngin that's got any attachment that they can get to. They're going to make sure our entire generation is taking pills of some sort or another to numb them. And I know it's your family doctors and it's not but the opinion. It's not people trying to be in rebellion. They're not trying to live in sin. You better be careful. And I, I wouldn't let them give you youngins hardly anything. The devil's not going to rest until this generation is numb to God and open portals to devils. Filthy dreamers. It's eating our, they defile the flesh. Despise dominion. Speak evil of dignities. That verse 8. If you want to see them, just turn your news on and all the inner city rioters. You can see them. Portland showed it to us. Seattle showed it to us. Washington, D.C. They're screaming against Israel right now. Dear time, Brother Pinion, right in Congress. We got terrorists in Congress wanting to destroy Israel. I'm talking about world and church conditions. Verse 9, there's Michael the archangel contending with the devil. Look at there, Brother Roger. Did it say he disputed about the body of Christ? Nope. He disputed about the body of Moses. What about that thing moving back after 2,000 years of the age of grace? This thing's turning back to the Jews. The spiritual warfare right now is more over Israel than it is over the church. The average church is living right in lead to see you. Got a lukewarmness that, in fact, Joe Parsons said lukewarmness is killing the best of us. He said it's flooded our lungs. We're breathing in and out of our very atmosphere, the atmosphere of lukewarmness. You'll have to violently cough that up. Pastors and preachers and evangelists in this hour, especially in the American church, you're going to have to violently cough up lukewarmness out of our lungs. I was reading G. Campbell Morgan this morning. I'm studying a series on the temptation of Christ there in the wilderness. But some years back, reading behind G. Campbell Morgan, he said this. He said, lukewarmness is the worst form of blasphemy. Of course, that got my attention. The worst form of blasphemy. Because it says, God, I know you're there, but I really don't care much. You don't mean enough to me to where I really just yawn. I see you there, Lord. That's why God said, I'd rather you be cold or hot than to treat me like I'm an indifferent thing. There it is, Michael. Church and world conditions. Look in verse 11 of Jude. Boy, if you want to bring it down to verse 11... 
Good to have Brother Larry Turbefield with us today. He was my associate pastor, ran my Christian school, and then he pastored many years. Good to have him here come to the Ringgold area to live. And Brother Larry, I don't know if you remember the message I preached out of verse 11. Where's everybody gone? Woe unto them, for they have gone. Where has everybody gone in this hour? Well, there's three places they've gone. They've gone in the way of Cain. They've ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. There's three characters that symbolize for you where everybody's gone. With Cain, they went with religion. They just got their own religion. Just make sure it's not the blood of Christ. With Balaam, they've gone after reward. Another opinion, that's why all these fellas are gone contemporary and mega church. America's offered them a big bribe. If you will give us Osteeny type church, we will give you this. I guarantee you sit me down with Brother Buster Kenzie, we could tell you what our evangelism ministries could be if we just dropped our standards and waved their flag. Oh, we. You get 10,000 Facebook likes. Brother Roger, I'd go on Facebook if they put a dislike button on there. Son, I'd be all over that thing. A big black thumbs down. That's what I need, and I'd be on Facebook. I'd be just hitting that thing all day long. ha <laughs> ha! Balaam, the whole Chattanooga Dalton area. They're giving the people what they want so that they can get what they want. Well, I'd rather take the bride than take the bribe. Maybe a few of us, Brother Pinion, but it was just a few with him. Jesus got to the end of his ministry, there was just a handful. One of them was a devil. <laughs> the odds. So which one of you is it? There's one of you. <laughs> Can't be Brother Roger or me. I know it ain't me or Brother Roger. <laughs> one of them was a devil. And the other 11 ran off and left him in his worst hour. Church, we have always looked like this from the very beginning. His ministry swelled up to the whole nation following in him and then swelled down pretty quick when he brought a cross in the picture. Where's everybody gone? Like Judas, there's a spirit of Jezebel in our churches and there's a spirit of Judas in our churches. The love of money, the love of position, the love, I'll take that bribe. Where's everybody gone? Cain, Balaam, Korah, there's your rebellion. There's Korah come out. Who does Moses think he is? Well, I tell you who he was. He was the man that God put in charge. Where's everybody gone? I could keep going. This Look down at verse 13. You want to see demon possession? Raging waves of the sea. Anytime you got the sea and you got, you got the sea mentioned in the Bible, that's the Gentile nations raging and foaming, go do your own study. Get your King James Bible and do your own studies. Raging and foaming are words associated directly with demon possession. Brother Pinion, even when we moved back here 26 years ago, I fear, I got two teenage daughters, I fear for my girls going to the gas station and back. I didn't feel that way 26 years ago. It's scary now. Raging waves of the sea. Foaming. Well, there's more here. Verse 14, there comes the rapture. Enoch. Whoop. Watch out for happy bubbles. There's the rapture. Y'all remember God took him. Help me now. Here's this rapture, and it's mentioned in verse 14. 14 is two sevens 
I really enjoyed studying Bible numbers. I reckon I got 15 books by men who have done the mathematical study in the King James Bible of biblical numerology. Kendall here has done some study too because I called her the other day from three states away and made her go get all the books out in my office and tell me what the number meant. She studied number 17 for an hour that day. She said, Dad, do your homework before you leave the house. <laughs> but number 14 is a, is a number of mass deliverance. Anytime you find number 14, almost every time you find number 14, it's God taking his people in mass and delivering them over to another country. It was the 14th day that they left Egypt and were brought out. In Matthew 1, 17, it, it mentions 14 three times in there, Brother Roger, three times, and it was from the captivity to the carrying away and from Abraham up into the captivity and from there unto Christ. Go look at Matthew 1, 17. Three 14s are mentioned and every time it was when they got delivered out and over. I didn't notice this till just now. This is a little extra. Whew. It's in the 14th verse that the type of the rapture shows up. I'm glad I've been born again. In a little while, there's going to be a shout and a voice and a trumpet and church, we're leaving out of here. Amen. Let me say this about the rapture. The Lord's not coming back just so American believers won't be inconvenienced by high gasoline. <laughs> I need a little help. We Americans, we, it is in our DNA to be self-centered and egocentric. We even think that the rapture is about Americans. <laughs> well, we're going to get a bad president. He's got to get us out of here soon. <laughs> Price of gas is going up. Oh, he's got to get us out of here. Now, Hillary, yeah, we do need to get out of here soon. <laughs> you know she's thinking to sneak in something. I'm waiting. I'm watching, Brother Joe. I got over to Tom McGuirk's one time. You remember that years ago when it was at Lookout Mountain? And he had a big canoe out there in some sort of campaign they were running, but he didn't notice the brand of it was Hillary. And it was right there on the Lord's in front of his church. I preached all week against Brother Tom and his Hillary boat. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't help him a lick, Brother George. He didn't get no help out of that. <laughs> oh, I got news for y'all. We're fixing to get raptured out of here, not because things are getting inconvenient for Americans, but because we're right there probably at the end of the church age. Well, I could keep going, but I want you to come to Revelation chapter 1, verse number 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead. I'm in Revelation 1, 5. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us. And washed us from our sins. In his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests unto God. And his father. To him be glory and dominion. Forever and ever. Amen. I simply this morning had a burden to say to you that uh, if you have the Lord, you have all you need to make it through these hours. <laughs> World conditions and church conditions, I didn't even get into our conditions. <laughs> Guarantee every Christian here is going through their own form of heavy trials. Some of your trials are very public. We've all been praying for Sister Pinion. Some of our trials are very private. Brother Pinion, you've pastored these years. You know good and well that there are some people going through some things. Even their husband and wife don't know it. Those things happen in our hearts and in our lives. Well, I've got good news for you. If you have Jesus, you have all you need. He's all you need. I want you to underline these things. Now, y'all took an awful long time with that introduction. I'm going to blame that on y'all. 
I got two chili dogs waiting on me. Y'all need to hurry up. Revelation 1, 5. I want you to underline these. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. Would you underline that word, witness? And I want to stop and thank God that in the presence of God, He's sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for me. He's a faithful witness in the presence of God on my behalf. Write this down. I'm going to have you write down a few things. Number one, Jesus is handling all my business with God. Hallelujah. I have a mediator. I have an intercessor. The dearest friend I've ever had is the Son of the Father. The Son's my Savior and the Father's my Redeemer. They teamed up to save me and Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father praying for me, pleading for me, looking out for me. In our mission trips over into Albania, we have to go through Europe and Italy and Greece, but oftentimes we go to Rome and land a plane. And look in through that city. Go look at Paul's prison and the catacombs. And I always go down there to see the Pope, see if he'll shake my hand. Not that I'm offering him the right hand of fellowship. But in that Vatican, they got them Popes, the most popular ones, they got them in glass coffins. There's a dead Pope, and they're gray and they're green. It's really strange. I didn't believe in green men until I seen Pope John Paul XVII. And they got them laid out there. And the whole world comes by, it seemed like, to worship them. Come by and pray to them. Brother Roger, people get on their knees and weep. And they toss little prayers over. They got four or five of those popes laid out in that Vatican. And I was moved heavily. Brother Turbefield was probably with me on that trip. And they'll arrest you in there. That's its own little sovereign nation. And that Swiss army guard, they'll arrest you. While we were there that week, a comedian made a joke about the Pope five miles away from the Vatican in another part of the city. They arrested him and gave him a sentence for several years. This freedom of religion that we have in America, they don't have it in Italy, they don't have it in England, they don't have it in most places of the world. Americans can go to church and don't want to. So you got to be careful what you say. And I was standing there and, and, and there was a large crowd. Brother Turbfield, do you remember, I think, we went down in that bottom section. And it was, I think it was Pope John Paul, one of the most popular. And they were gathered around him by the hundreds. Every day, 30,000 visitors a day on the low days. Go to the Vatican. How many visitors y'all get here a day? Pastor, 30,000? <laughs> I think our independent Baptist church may have a little smaller number than 30,000 visitors a day. They offering some kind of chili dog that we ain't got. <laughs> we were standing there and a woman was weeping. And she was praying. And she was so heavy. She, Brother Rogers, she was broken about something. She was weeping and praying. It broke my heart that she's praying to a pope. Brother Hall, before I knew it, I heard a loud voice saying, Now there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And I'm, I'm not joking. I, I, it was me. I really didn't know it. I honestly didn't. I was so moved at how awful that was. And I wanted them people to know. And in my heart, it wasn't even a conscious. It just came out louder than I knew and I didn't even know it was going to come out. Just watching her weep and pray moved me to the point and I said, before I knew it, I, Quoting that Timothy, 
Now there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I done went upstairs and looked at that first thing you see when you walk in. I'm talking about the false religions of the world. Madonna holding a dead Jesus, a larger than life statue, the first thing you see when you walk in their cathedral, the Vatican. And it's a weeping Mary holding the dead body of Jesus. I done looked at that too long and got worked up. And then I have news for y'all. We have a faithful witness and he's at the right hand of the Father. He's handling all my business with God. I can go to him with my sins. I can go to him with my sorrows. I can go to him with my struggles. I can go to him with my scary fears. I can go to him with anything that life brings. I can go to him with our sons and daughters. But every good church I know is just weeping over where are our grown kids and look at my grandkids. What a mess we're in. I'm glad I can carry our children to the Father. Yes. Amen. Yes. I have a faithful witness. Yes. Yes. He's handling all my business with God. Number two, underline this. And the first begotten of the dead Underline that dead. He's the first begotten of the dead. Not only is he handling all my business right now with God, he's handling all my business with the grave. Thank God he conquered death, hell, and the grave. Amen. We buried my dad in September. We just now got the tombstone in place. I hadn't been over there. I'm going to take my family and I'm going to get over there. Probably, Brother George, I'll kneel down with my children and thank God that we had a godly debt and a godly granddad. And then, Brother George, I may move over a little in case the trumpet blows. Dad will be coming out right before we leave. <laughs> Woo! Thank God when you belong to him, there is no fear in death. There is no sting in death. The grave can't hold us. It couldn't hold him. Every once in a while I get asked to preach an Easter sermon. And I got one Easter. I got ten of them, but I, only got, I end up preaching the same one every time because I like it. I was reading behind an old preacher that's in heaven now and he said, the best news I ever got came from the graveyard. <laughs> he is not here, but he is risen. Yeah. Doesn't the Bible say, because I live, you shall live also? Yeah. I got three points to that sermon. Brother Larry, Brother Roger, y'all don't be stealing this. All right, you can steal it because I stole it. <laughs> three points on he is not here. Thank God he arose. Yeah. Number two, he was here. When Jesus died, his spirit went to heaven, his soul went to hell, and his body went to the grave. Yeah. I don't quite have the time to expound that, but when Jesus died, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. And in Psalms 16 or 116 and Acts 2, that will not leave my soul in hell. We believe that man's body, soul, and spirit, according to 1 Thessalonians 5, God's three parts, you are too. When Jesus died, he went to all three worlds, and I don't care what NASA tells you, there are no other worlds. Yeah. When Jesus died, he went to all three worlds at the same time and secured my salvation in every one of them. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo! His spirit went to heaven and secured me a place there in the blood. His soul went to hell, Joe Parsons said, and scraped me off the bottom of it. He was making me a place in heaven while scraping me off the bottom of hell. And his body went to the grave so that when my body goes, he will already have been the forerunner. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. He is not here. 
he was here, and then the third, he'll be here when it's my time to cross. He'll be here. You know what the Lord done for us, Brother Pinion? When Dad died, we'd all, all of us in the ministry in six states, everybody, even my two sisters, one married a pastor and one run a Christian school. Everybody was in the ministry. We lived everywhere. Didn't have a lot of birthdays together. Didn't have a lot of Saturday morning breakfast together. Didn't yard sale together. Everybody in different places serving. But God brought dead over here and let him die in just three months. That was very merciful. He could have died for a decade. That would have killed mom. Took him quick. 78. Gave him 70 plus 8. Brother Pinion running overtime at 82. And still healthy. What a blessing. You ought to grow your long beard and smoke your pipe the last few years. Just enjoy yourself. Well, I mean, don't do the pipe, kids. Dad let him sit over here for three months and let all of us kids come and spend... And everybody just got to sit with them and sit with them and sit with them and have our own memories and have our own little talks. What about God let us do that? My last memory with Dad. I'm telling you, when you get there, he'll be there. He's faithful. You'll not walk through the valley of the shadow of death alone. Amen. The last thing that happened between me and him was three in the morning over here in the hospital. He was so restless. He was dying. Kept doing that. I don't know if y'all been around hospice much or been around. And they said, you know, when they just die out naturally, said There's a, we call that climbing the ladder. They're always reaching and pulling. <laughs> wonder where that instinct comes from. <laughs> climbing the ladder. Dad was so restless that night he couldn't rest. And I finally come over and I thought, if I had prayer with him, that might calm him down. So I just, I didn't know if he could hear me. I said, Dad? Uh, yeah. And he was coming and going. Sometimes he was, his mind was there. Sometimes it wasn't. He said, what is it, Dean? <laughs> he knew. I said, do you want to have prayer? He said, yeah. Brother Larry, I thought, I, and I was fixing to pray. I was fixing to have a big prayer with him and hoping to calm him down, but he beat me to it. I wasn't thinking of him praying. He said, yeah. And I was fixing to pray. And then he said, our Father. And I just got quiet and let him pray. He said, Lord, we thank you that you do all things well. Glory. He said, we thank you that you're doing everything that's right for us. And Brother Roger, I'll never, he said two or three things. But one thing will never leave me. He said, Lord, thank you for supporting us with the scriptures while we're in this particular valley. <laughs> he said, you've always supported us with the scriptures. And he prayed something else and then he kept on praying but he faded. And he laid there and his lips was moving but I couldn't. He'd done eased out of this world. He, he was done sitting in there in that inner chamber somewhere in the throne room with the Lord. I got news for y'all. He's a faithful witness. He's taking care of all my business with God and he's going to be faithful at the grave. He's the first begotten of the dead. There's four other things there, but we can look at them at another time. I'm glad he's an anchor that we can hold on to, aren't you? Yes. He's faithful. He's faithful. Sister, is she going to play? Would you softly begin to play for us, sister? Can you all imagine John on the Isle of Patmos? 
He's an old preacher. All the other apostles had done been martyred and killed a long time ago. He was faithful to the Lord. He was faithful in little things. He took care of the mother of Jesus. He came out of there and he took care of the little children. Remember he wrote 1 John, little children. He was so faithful. Got bold in all and they couldn't even kill him. He was faithful to the cross. Yes. Yes. He's the only one that showed up at the cross, y'all. He's the only one that showed up at the cross. He's the only one they couldn't kill. And as an old preacher, he's sitting on that rocky island of Patmos. I don't know if you've ever met Brother Charles Lawson over in Knoxville, Tennessee. He's your age, I think, exactly, maybe. Still pastoring there in Knoxville. Preached Ed Ballou's funeral. Brother Lawson told me I've been on Patmos. He'd been to the Holy Land a dozen times or so. He said there's no trees, there's no grass, there's no wildlife. That's why they banish people there. Just a rocky island. Barren. No inhabitants. Do you reckon John was sitting there at the end of his ministry and said, and I don't know, this is just me thinking. You reckon John said, Lord, I've been faithful all these years, and is this how it's going to end? Does this how it end, me sitting here? All alone, barren island. Is this how it ends? And I could imagine that angel tap him on the shoulder and say, No. No, it's actually not going to end like this. Matter of fact, the Lord wants you to take a pen. <laughs> Fixing to write the book of Revelation. He's going to show you how this thing ends. Folks, we're on the winning side. He's handling all my business. I want you to bow your head. I want us to stand. How many Christians would like to just come around and let's pray? Let's pray one for another. Let's pray for our trials. Let's pray for our burdens. Some of you with families ought to bring them families down here. Let your youngins know what it is to pray on an altar with their mama and with their daddy. Won't you bring your youngins down here and have prayer? You don't have to be a member here to come and pray. Somebody running from God, you want to come and pray? Somebody need to be saved. Why don't you come and pray? Sister Penny, if you'll play out loud now, we'll let them pray.
God's people said amen for that faithful witness this morning, the Lord Jesus. Somebody said, well, preacher, if I, if I could just see, if, if, if it was just evidence, why don't you come to him and ask him? Come and, come and talk to him about it, and you'll find, the, you'll find the reality of it. If you're around and you're looking for signs and wonders and miracles to persuade you that, you, that, that he's real, and you're going to go to heaven, you're going to die and go to hell. Sure as a world. There are a lot of choices you can make. But there's one choice you don't have anything to do with at all, and that's the choice to stay here. You can't stay here. You don't have to go to heaven, and you don't have to go to hell. But I can tell you, you can't stay here. We're all going to die. And we're going to have to make a choice about whether or not we go to heaven. Preacher, thank you for the good word of God this morning. I'm glad I've got a faithful witness in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Let me say again, thank you for being here, being a part of this special day. And those of you who worked and invited people to come, thank you for doing that. And I encourage you, those of you who are visiting today, please, please, if you don't have a church home, come back. We'll, we'd love to have you come back. And... Uh, uh, be a part of what's going on around here. Now that our, our ladies are over in the fellowship hall and, and they have lunch fixed, I tell you, for those who, who are going to stay and eat, and, and everybody's welcome to stay and eat, uh, I've said those who have visitors, we'll cut Dean back to one hot dog. We'll have to. <laughs> but uh, uh, there, there's plenty of food there, and we want you to stay and, and enjoy that time of fellowship together. We're going to have the blessing here. And uh, let, let me see. Greg, Sisson, would you go over and tell the ladies, go ahead and tell them that we already had the blessing so they'll know that we're, they're ready to eat. Okay, let's do that. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless the food and the fellowship. And you, you just stay and enjoy the time. The building's good and cool. And you won't have to stand in line like you will at Golden Corral. You won't have to get in a drive through like you do at McDonald's. Uh, you can just go through and get your food and sit down and enjoy a fellowship with people that uh, you care about and that you enjoy being with. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the precious word of God this morning. Thank you for Brother Dean. I, Lord, uh, thank you for his faithfulness. Lord, I pray you'd continue to touch him and bless him and bless his family. Uh, Lord, uh, continue to uh, use him in the work of the Lord in these days. Now, bless our time of fellowship. Bless the food this morning and uh, use it to strengthen our bodies. Help us be faithful to you. We'll give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. All right, you're dismissed.